my office hour today from in the afternoon to just uh, right after the class. So we want to talk about the midterm. Uh, please come to see me right after the class. From the midterm, I guess, from, from what I saw from the exam, some of you are made several computation errors. And there were a few that I'm very worried who got the score quite below the mean minus the standard deviation. Mm. I think it's best, in that case, if you, uh, find your score extremely unsatisfying, it's best uh, either you find someone to discuss about the exam or uh, come to see me, see the GSI, and see where it went wrong. That's the best way to find a way to improve, in my opinion. Some of you did extremely well. See the mean plus the standard deviation is pretty high. Uh, the maximum score is a uh, one of you got full score in the exam. The lowest score is a uh, below fifteen points. Okay. So uh, today I want to talk about so from from this lecture now from today on next few lectures. What I would do is uh, sort of uh, selected topics, selected research topics, which is using many of the techniques we have learned at the first half of the class. And these selected research topics, some of them are developed over here in Berkeley. Some of them are developed uh, elsewhere and has been very popularly used in the community. Today, uh, topic is about internal model principle. This is an extremely useful uh, tool in feedback and feedforward design. And one particular application, so this is the basic concept. And one particular application is repetitive control. We usually call internal model principle as shortened as INP, and this is a application of INP. Okay. So depending on the time, I think I'll cover INP. If I have time, I will cover repetitive control as well. I want to start with a very basic review something that you probably are very familiar with in your undergraduate control class. Suppose I have a feedback system, and I design this controller C as a PID controller, very basic PID controller. And then the disturbance is a constant disturbance. Let's say dk equal to d0, okay? What's the conclusion you can make from uh, very basic PID control design. You can conclude that any constant disturbance, no matter the value of D0, under PID control, the steady state error will be zero. That's the power of PID control. Actually, it's the I action, integration action inside this controller. Okay. Now, what is the Z transform for a constant disturbance? Uh, I'm using the continuous time. What's the Laplace transform? for con constant disturbance. S, uh, D0 divided by S, okay? So you can analyze how Ys depends on Ds. I'm assuming zero reference here. So you can write down uh, the transfer function between the disturbance and the error, okay? Which is the negative P, so which is negative P divided by one plus Pc. If you if we are assuming, in my case, a simple example of a first-order plant, 
and then a PID controller. You can do the computation. Let's do a very quick computation. I want to show you. Then you can get negative P, P divided by 1 plus PS. You're going to get MS plus B, KP plus KI, 1 divided by S plus KDS. So multiply, for the numerator denominator, multiply both the parts by MS plus B times S. So this is the transfer function between D and E. You're going to get the result of negative S divided by MS plus B S plus KPS plus KI plus KD S square. Okay? <coughs> so you have just seen that the disturbance DS equals now put in DS equals D0 divided by S. You can see these two are going to cancel. The disturbance mode is going to cancel with the zero here, with the numerator here. What you get is the uh, what you get is this final conclusion. Okay. So you see from here, you see the arrow is going to go to zero because this is a stable uh, polynomial here. What's the structure of the arrow? If I ask you, if let's say this uh, the close to poles are a pair of complex poles, stable complex poles. What's the structure of EP? You have to do the inverse Laplace transform. What's the inverse Laplace transform on this? Just tell me the structure. It's going to be a decaying sinusoidal signal, right? So it's going to be some, something like this. It's going to decay to zero. Now, if you haven't seen this, this is another perspective of looking at this. So the disturbance has this structure, you see. And here, if you look at the controller, you just uh, massage the controller into this. You factor out this integration part and then put this remainder, remaining terms inside. You see, the disturbance structure is appearing as part of the controller. Okay, disturbance at the zero uh, a pole at you uh, at origin, and the controller exactly has a pole over there. So the takeout message is that the disturbance, the structure of the disturbance, the case is the same if there is a reference signal here. Uh, you can analyze, but the structure of the disturbance is built into this integral controller. Okay, so this is a very basic uh, example of the internal model principle. So you see, the result carries to not only uh, the disturbance when the disturbance is a constant, but when the disturbance has a general structure. Let's say the Laplace transform of the disturbance is BDS divided by ADS. Then. This is called the internal model principle, which says if the controller contains the structure of the disturbance, if the controller is structured this way, B, C divided by A, D, then divide, uh, multiplied by some term. Namely, if A, C can be decomposed to include A, D, disturbance structure inside, then the message is that the disturbance will be asymptotically rejected. Very basic, very intuitive idea. If you build the disturbance structure inside the controller, it's like, think about uh, this way. The controller is going to create sort of a counter disturbance generator. It's going to create something that's going to cancel this guy over here. And then we're going to achieve asymptotic disturbance rejection. To be more, to be more, a little bit more specific, there are certain conditions which are very general and uh, easy to satisfy. Is this? 
you have to, to make this work. This disturbance denominator and this numerator of the plant, they should not have common roots. Okay, What will happen if, if they have common roots? If uh, the disturbance is integrator and here uh, BP is S, what will happen? more, let's say ds is b0, s, and ps is s divided by s squared plus a k1s plus k2. What will happen in this case? They cancel. What does it physically mean? It means your plant has a differentiator inside, right? S is a differentiation. And your disturbance is a constant, BP equals B0. Now, if a constant disturbance goes, goes into a differentiator, what will happen? It's going to become zero, right? If you put it in a differentiation, the output is zero. Okay. So in this case, you wouldn't need to consider an extra design of the controller because the disturbance is already canceled. That's the idea for the assumption here. Okay. Now, uh, Let's take a very quick moment, similar as the PID control example, to prove that the steady state error is indeed zero. So in this case, uh, let's consider just the disturbance rejection problem and assume the reference is zero. Then do the same thing. Compute the transfer function between the disturbance and the error. So I'm using the structure, using the notations I have here. I have negative P is going to be negative BP divided by AP. 1 plus PC is going to be 1 plus BP, AP. And C is, uh, my notation is BC divided by AC. So you're going to get negative BP, AC divided by APAC plus BPBC. Okay. Now, include the Laplace transform of the disturbance here. You're going to get this final result. And the, the recall the conditions of this internal model principle that the controller AC has to include the model of the disturbance. AC is equals the mod of the disturbance times something else. Okay? So if that happens, you see this disturbance mode is gonna get canceled over here, and what's remaining is just this guy. AC prime times VB. Okay. You see here, this is the characteristic polynomial of the closed loop system. So this whole Laplace transform is stable. And if you do the inverse Laplace transform to something that is uh, stable, then the signal will uh, asymptotically go to zero. Okay? Now, unless you have uh, uh, any questions, I will ask you one question. This question might be tricky. So you see here, in the example of integral control, AD is S. Right? S is marginally stable. Now, in the general case, this can be some marginally stable poles on this uh, imaginary axis. Now, you are doing cancellation of this guy with this guy. So, you're doing marginally pole zero cancellation. 
why is that feasible? I was directing you to something that's tricky. <coughs> of course, one way to think, uh, I, I don't guarantee this way is correct, is that uh, we, are, we learned it's not correct to do unstable pole zero cancellation, but we didn't learn it's incorrect to do marginally stable pole zero cancellation. You might, you might think that way, but that way is not uh, the correct way to see this case. Anyone has any thoughts? So how many of you think this is wrong? We can't do this cancellation. This proof is wrong. If you think this is correct, then what I said is wrong. Which one is wrong? <coughs> Tricky, right? Maybe I should put this as a midterm exam. <coughs> All right, so here is the, <coughs> the way to understand this. When we learn close to design, we say we can't do unstable pole, <coughs> we can't do unstable pole zero cancellation between the controller and the plant, right? This, is, this should be straightforward. We can't do that. Now, what you see here is, is a different case, you see. What we're canceling is the disturbance structure and some models in the, some, some parts in the plant. We're not doing cancellation of between the controller and the uh, plant. Okay, that's the first way, that's the first thing to recognize here. Okay, so whatever, let me put it into a little bit more detail. So unstable pole zero cancellation. If you think about the details, is that when we compute the closed loop characteristic polynomial, we compute one plus PC equal to zero, which equivalent to say one plus BC, AC, BP, AP equal to zero, which is equivalent to AP, AC plus BC, BP equal to zero. So the closed loop poles come out of this polynomial. There's no question about this. If you have uh, unstable pole zero cancellation, so let's suppose AP has an unstable uh, pole. So let me call that unstable pole as S minus one, unstable definitely, then times something else. So if I'm doing unstable pole zero cancellation, I'm using BC to cancel this unstable pole. So I have to do this design, BC prime. Here, uh, from these guys, you're gonna get S minus one, uh, AP prime, AC plus BC prime, BP equal to zero. So you see, if you do that straight out of this equation polynomial here, you're gonna have an unstable pole, close to unstable pole, that you are doing cancellation here, okay? That is why you can't do pole zero, unstable pole zero cancellation. Okay, now here, you see, no matter, coming back to here, no matter how I'm doing cancellation here, what are the close to poles? Where does the close to pole come from? What's the close to characteristic polynomial? It's here, right? The close to the close to characteristic polynomial is still, still this guy. No matter how I do cancellation here, 
this AD is never part of the closed loop characteristic polynomial. So what I'm, what I'm canceling here is not going to influence my closed loop fold. This is a strict mathematics. Okay. So that's why uh, the closed loop closed loop poles is independent of what kind of disturbance you are applying to the system. Okay. So that's why when we are doing cancellation here, we are not influencing the closed loop poles. Okay. Now. <coughs> what we have done is the continuous time case. The result is exactly the same in the discrete time case. So my notations in this case is follows from uh, my last lecture. I'm using z negative one in all these transfer function notations. So I have controller, plant, and then disturbance structure. The assumptions here are the same. So you have to assume you, uh, we have to assume that this disturbance structure is not uh, canceled with the existing plant, okay? I.e., BP and AD, they don't have any common zeros, okay? So in this case, it's meaningful to do uh, internal model principle design. So the assumptions are closed loop asymptotically stable, which is, uh, which has to be true. We designed this closed loop to be stable. And then the other assumption is, uh, again, the controller, AC, has to contain the disturbance structure. AC has to equal to AC prime times AD, okay, to cancel this disturbance. Under these assumptions, the disturbance is rejected. So those are the two very main concepts for today's lecture. I hope uh, you don't have difficulty understanding that. Now, uh, what's coming next is something more practical about the implementation. I've talked about disturbance models, disturbance structures with seeing constant disturbances. Now, I want to go through several more class of disturbances where I want to uh, show how this AD looks like for different class of disturbances, okay? Uh, the first case, now we're doing, remember here, we're doing discrete time design. So for constant disturbance, dk equal to d sub zero, the disturbance, if you do the uh, z transform, you're gonna see AD has to be equal to one minus z negative one. Okay, and if you do, if you consider sinusoidal disturbances, then this is the corresponding AD in the Z transform. And I have shown RAM signal and periodic signal. Now I wanna I wanna do several examples to show how these are related, okay? We have seen continuous time, dt equal to d corresponds to, uh, this is the Laplace transform. So meaning ad equal to f. Now discrete time case, dk equal to d0. From my table, I'm saying ad corresponds to one minus d negative one, okay? So you can understand this by doing considering the Laplace transform and Z transform. Another way to look at this is that, uh, <coughs> look at AD times, if I do the discrete time case, okay? If I consider Z as a delay operator, Z minus one as a delay operator, what's the result? One minus D negative one, DK. Gonna be DK minus dk minus one. And if dk is a constant, I'm gonna get this is zero. Okay, so that's one way to understand this. Another way, so you from here you see clearly this characterizes the disturbance. This is the structure of the disturbance. 
Let me do another example, the periodic example. This one is also easier to see. So AD equals one minus D negative N, and uh, my disturbance is periodic. So if I do this computation, I'm gonna get DK minus DK minus N. If it's periodic, DK equals DK minus N, then this guy's gonna be zero, okay? I would uh, suggest you to do an exercise, exercise to show the case for sinusoidal signals, okay? And uh, show that for ramp signal, it's gonna be AD is gonna have this structure as an exercise. <coughs> so now you have seen uh, what kind of structures the controller should have to reject this disturbance. I wanna give you now a different perspective view of this control design. Remember, we learned loop shaping. We discussed the idea of, uh, if I consider the transfer function between disturbance and the output, I'm gonna have P, so this is G, D to Y equals P divided by one plus P C. Okay, so we have discussed uh, correspondingly the sensitivity function is one divided by one plus P C. Sensitivity function is characterizing the D the transfer function between this output disturbance, if I call it D prime, D tilde. Sensitivity function is the transfer function between D tilde to Y. So if I wanna reject the disturbance, that means I want to make the magnitude of, D, of these transfer functions to be small for disturbance rejection, okay? And we discuss this concept of loop shaping where we're doing this shape of PC, the magnitude response, okay? We talk about you should have to be, it should be lower bounded but low frequency and upper bounded at high frequency, okay? <coughs> now, which is exactly showing this. At low frequency, I want PC to be large such that this, uh, transfer function has small magnitude, okay? Now, make it a little bit more general. If I wanna have good performance at certain frequencies, at some particular frequency, then I should increase my gain. I should increase magnitude of PC, such that one divided by one plus PC. If this is large, then this is gonna be small. So that's high gain feedback design, all right? Now, after this short review, I want you to take a look at this, <coughs> this example, this internal model principle, where now, if you compute PC, then uh, considering that C contains a disturbance model inside, then you're gonna get this, okay? <coughs> now, look at this guy. At frequencies where, at those omegas, where AD equals to zero, what's the magnitude of this guy, PC? Large, right? If frequency is close to this, the magnitude is gonna be very large. So we'll have high gain feedback design at this particular frequency. So in other words, if we have high gain feedback design, then we have disturbance rejection from what we have just discussed. So you see, hopefully you can see that internal model principle exactly, uh, it's showing the design of high gain control in its uh, structure, okay? And uh, the method that we are achieving this high gain control is to contain, is to let the controller contain sort of counter disturbance generator, AD over here, and we can achieve that. I have briefly discussed the last bullet point here, which I say uh, DD 
is the Z transform of DK. Okay. <coughs> so this is another way to understand this <coughs> is that <coughs> DK uh, <coughs> is the impulse response of CB divided by AB. <coughs> okay, because in this way, what's the Z transform of a impulse response, of an impulse function in this free time domain? Z transform. What's the definition of Z transform then? Summation of delta K, Z negative K. Hey, tell me, tell me. What is the Z transform of a delta function? Why? I don't get it. So uh, when, I, when I was an undergrad, uh, I was afraid to ask questions. And then someday, a professor in the class said, uh, told me, what's the, what, what is the most stupid question? What is the most, yes. The most stupid questions are those you don't ask. All right? If you don't ask, then this, I won't be able to know it, and you won't be able to know it. So if you know it, let me know, please. Here, okay, what I, I was talking about. Okay, I was talking about the Z transform of this delta function is one, and then I was gonna show you that the Z transform of DK, if you consider this way, the Z transform of DK is gonna be the transfer function here times the Z transform of the input. Okay, so <coughs> exactly, DK, it's the impulse response of this uh, model of the disturbance over here. If you see that point, then I mentioned that this guy will go to zero. I did several examples for the constant disturbance and for periodic disturbance. I showed you numerically that this guy is gonna go to zero. And this is explaining you why exactly that mathemat this mathematic happens, okay? So do this computation because dk is the impulse response of this guy, then I'm gonna get dk is dv ab delta k. So uh, multiply ad on both sides, you're gonna get ad times dk equals cb times delta k, okay? Now, because this is a impulse, because this is a impulse signal, then no matter what kind of bd is, this is exactly showing you why from all the discussions I made, I, did, I never talked about what BD should have. I didn't mention at all, okay? So suppose BD is a general polynomial of Z, let's say, K1 plus K2, Z negative one, whatever, K uh, X, Z negative X. <coughs> Regardless of the structure, if you have a impulse going through this finite impulse response digital filter. You see, in the end, it's gonna always go to zero. What is the, if I uh, ask you, what is the mathematic expression of the output, BD times delta K? Can someone let me know if uh, BD is in this structure? <coughs> <coughs> it's gonna be K1 delta K plus K2 delta K minus one all the way to KX delta K minus X, all right? Take any K larger than or la larger than X, okay? Take any K larger than X. What will be delta K here? 
zero, 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 all the way, everything is zero. So you see, after a certain time, this guy will always be zero. Okay, so that is, uh, that is just showing you why the structure of phi D doesn't matter, the final result. Only A D matters. <coughs> So if you think about what we have done, what we have finished is a big review of integral control in PID design. Then we introduced two internal model principles, one in continuous time, one in discrete time. And then we analyzed typical structures of the disturbance of AD. Uh, <coughs> and now you have a basic idea of what closed loop design should be when the disturbance has certain structures. Now, in the remainder of the course, we are going to focus on this particular case where AD is a periodic signal. So we're gonna analyze the case, this is called repetitive control. But hopefully from here, we can make the generalization of understanding the case for other disturbances. Let's take a look. So now you know the big picture. I should include AD in my controller design, okay? <coughs> what are the remaining steps? It's simply how I obtain BC and AC prime. These are the unknowns over here. Everything else is known, okay? So there are two ways, uh, there are at least two ways, okay? We're gonna discuss only two ways. One is a pole placement, and the other is, a, is based on cancellation of the plant dynamics. So the first term is hopefully related to, uh, if you took the class ME132 here, this is gonna be related to that. Or if you take it undergrad class from somewhere else, uh, hopefully you will also see the, have seen the concept of pole placement. And the second uh, method here, Cancellation of plant dynamics. This is directly related to what we discussed last time. Uh, model based, model, model inversion based uh, feed forward design. The ideas are very similar here. So we're gonna start with the pole placement example. And, uh, as a prerequisite, let me introduce a theorem to you. Looks like it's a, a big chunk of matrix, but the idea is pretty simple. So it says this, consider a transfer function, a rational transfer function. It contains numerators, denominators, okay? The coefficients of the denominators are beta one to beta n, numerators alpha one to alpha n. So I'm assuming the order of the numerator is uh, one degree less than the order of the denominator over here. The theorem says these two numerator denominator polynomials will be co-prime. Co-prime just means they don't have common roots, okay? The theorem says they won't have common roots if and only if this matrix S is non-singular. So the structure of the matrix S is uh, shown over here. Okay, it has a name actually, but uh, don't worry about it. Uh, instead of proving this guy, I wanna show you some examples to, te to let you see that this actually makes sense. Examples are, let me see. Examples are, this one, if alpha n equal to zero, and alpha one to alpha n minus one, they don't, they are non-zero. And beta one equal to one, beta two equal to, I'm thinking alpha one, then so beta i plus one equal to beta, equal to alpha i. In this case, you're gonna get uh, beta divided by alpha equals, beta one is one. One being n minus one. 
plus beta 2 is alpha 1, so it's alpha 1 g n minus 2, all the way to beta n is alpha n minus 1 divided by g n plus alpha 1 g n minus 1 plus alpha n minus 1 g plus 0, because I'm assuming alpha n is 0. Okay? So if that happens, you see the transfer function reduces to 1 minus g. Okay? So you have a lot of pole 0 cancellations over there. So definitely uh, alpha and beta are not co-prime in that case. Let's take a look at the matrix over here. So I have uh, alpha n equal to 0 in this example equal to zero in this example, let me. Then uh, beta one equal to one, beta one equal to one. You probably already can see something here. Beta one equal to one, beta two equal to alpha, L, alpha one. Then all the way, beta n to equal to alpha n minus one. What you will happen is that you see some columns of the matrix here immediately become linearly dependent. And this matrix immediately becomes Non, uh, singular if you see some uh, pole zero cancellations over here. Okay? So this is a general result which can be useful for us. Okay? <coughs> okay? So I mentioned we are going to do two designs for repetitive control. One is pole placement. The other is uh, based on cancellations. If you do pole, pole placement, then uh, this is very basic. You're gonna uh, design the closed loop characteristic polynomials to be some predefined polynomials over here. So suppose this is the desired, desired closed loop characteristic polynomial. Then uh, compute this guy the characteristic polynomial in this loop is going to be bc times c minus d b p bc times c minus d b p plus this ac prime ad and at ac prime ad and at okay so you design this guy to be this what are the unknowns here are we know the prime so this is known we know Planck numerator Planck denominator and we know uh, disturbance structure. We don't know BC and AC prime, okay? This is what we're gonna solve. And this is, this equation, such type of polynomial equation has a general name. It's called a Dauphin-Tai equation. In some other, uh, in digital signal processing, you might also hear, hear that something called the Bazu identity. The zoo identity. Uh, they are talking about something very similar. Okay. So we have to design, specify the desired closed loop dynamic, and then if we do that, then we can match the coefficients. These are nothing but polynomial equations. So the coefficients on both sides they have to match. So if we design this guy matching the coefficients of z negative y on both sides, then we will be able to solve this polynomial equation, okay? That's a big picture. And now comes to the place where we're gonna use the theorem we just introduced. If we're gonna do this design, we have two questions to ask, at least two questions, okay? First of all, how do we choose the desired closed loop dynamics? And then second, uh, if, we cho if we have chosen that, how can we guarantee that this equation has a solution, has a unique solution in particular, okay? So these are the two conditions we have to consider. What about the first one? What are the constraints for choosing be, uh, eta, the desired closed loop characteristic polynomial? This one is relatively easier, okay? Def at least has to be stable, right? Stable is the first case. And then a second condition will come up right after 
we answer, we try to answer the second question, okay? So how can, we, how can we guarantee this kind of equations has a solution? It's right here. Okay, so you see, in general, we're doing this. We know eta, we know alpha, we know beta, okay? Given eta, alpha, and beta, these polynomials, we want to solve sigma and gamma, these two polynomials, okay? The conditions, the conditions for solutions to exist are right here. Conditions are alpha and beta, okay? These two known polynomials, they are co-prime. They don't have common zeros, okay? And the second condition is this, is the desired closed sub characteristic polynomial. It cannot, the order of the desired closed sub characteristic polynomial cannot be too high. These are the two uh, conditions for a unique solution to exist for sigma polynomial and gamma polynomial. Okay? So I will connect this theorem with the theorem we have introduced uh, several slides earlier in this proof, okay? It's gonna be slightly, uh, slightly require a little bit algebra, but I hope you get the key ideas. The detailed mathematics is uh, not challenging to arrive, but the idea uh, is not easy to get at the first time when you see this, okay? so. Look at this polynomial equation here. Let me give you one example. Let's say alpha equals one plus uh, alpha one, z negative one. Sigma equals sigma zero plus sigma one, z negative one. Plus beta, let's say it equals beta one, z negative one. Very simple example. And gamma equals gamma, zero plus gamma one, z minus one, okay? Suppose we know these, and we want to solve this, and we want this polynomial equation to equal to one plus eta one, z one, plus eta two, z two, okay? So do a little computation and see what this equation exactly means. It means if I multiply these terms out, I'm gonna get sigma one plus uh, sig sigma zero plus sigma one times z negative one plus alpha one sigma zero z minus one plus alpha one sigma one z minus two. That's the first uh, product term. Then plus the second product term. I have gamma zero beta one. Gamma zero beta one z minus one and then gamma one, beta one, z minus two. This guy has to equal to one plus eta one, z minus one plus eta two, z minus two, okay? So you see, to make this equal, I have to make sure that the coefficients has to be equal. Sigma one has to equal to one, and then the coefficients for z negative one has to equal. I have sigma one plus gamma zero beta one has to equal to eta one. And then alpha one sigma zero gamma one plus gamma one beta one equal to eta two. Finally, alpha one sigma one has to equal to, oh, I made a typo here. The coefficients for, I made a typo. Excuse me, so the co co coefficients for z negative one is this guy, this guy, plus this guy. Um, I have to include this guy here, alpha one, sigma zero. And then the coefficients for z minus two, this one is correct. Okay, so exact, essentially is about this equality here. Three equations has to be satisfied to make this polynomial equation hold. 
Now, look at these guys and uh, do a little bit algebra to make it look like, let's see. This is my desired goal. I want to make sure the unknowns appear here. I want to make sure sigma 0, sigma 1, gamma 0, gamma 1 appears here. And then on the right hand side, there's some vector. So let's see how that's going to happen. So I have 1 times sigma 1, si sigma 0 has to be equal to 0. And uh, sigma 0 times alpha 1 plus sigma 1 plus beta 1 times gamma 0, beta 1 times gamma 0 has to be equal to eta 1. Finally, I have to have alpha 1, then 0 times sigma 1, then gamma 1 times beta 1, gamma 1 times beta 1. Okay? Essentially, I have to make this happen. I have to make sure this matrix equation has a unique solution. Okay? Huh? Huh? Oh, one. Yes. Okay. <coughs> All right. So, you see, in this matrix here, these are all knowns. All knowns. Because uh, alpha one and beta one, I said, I told you they are known. And these guys are unknown. And these guys, again, are all known. Okay? So, you have this matrix equation here. More generally, the general case looks nothing but this. Okay? You're going to have something S that contains the coefficients of uh, uh, alpha and beta. And then, on the, on the other hand, uh, on the other side of the equation, you have to be uh, coefficients, composed of coefficients of eta over here. Okay? So, these are unknown. These are all known. Okay? If you do the exact multiplication here, this matrix S is exactly the matrix that we introduced several slides earlier. Okay? That's the, uh, <coughs> the matrix here. Let me bring it back to you. Okay? This S is exactly this matrix here. Yeah, this S is the matrix here. They're the same. Okay? So, recall this example. To have a unique solution, okay, the orders of these matrices are, this is a 2n by 1 vector, 2n, 2n minus 1 vector. Okay, this matrix here is a 2n minus 1 square matrix. Okay, so now you see, the conditions for a unique solution to exist is that this matrix is invertible. Okay? So this comes right back to here. We, we uh, have to assume this, we have to uh, make sure that this matrix is invertible. So the conditions now, to make this invertible, I have to make sure alpha and beta, they are co-prime. They don't have common roots. Okay? So that's the conditions here for S. So, co-prime condition, co-prime condition between alpha and beta assures that S is invertible. And on the other hand, uh, we have to make sure that this vector here, this vector consists uh, coefficients of the desired characteristic polynomial. Okay, so this condition is saying the degree, the degree of this polynomial has to be less than or equal to two n minus one, because otherwise I'm going to have further coefficients here, 2n, and then all the way. And you won't be able to, uh, from here, you won't be able to solve this equation. This extra degree of freedom won't be able to uh, achieve using this uh, 2n by 1 matrix equation. Okay? So, let me, in summary, in summary is here. Okay, this Dauphin-Tang equation has a unique solution if alpha and beta are co-prime, and then this there is a relative degree requirement. 
for the desired characteristic polynomial. Okay. So as you as you see, as you see now, uh, when we As you see now, we call this big picture, okay? We said we're gonna do this pole placement design, okay? We just have to solve this equation. The idea, you, this is usually the case. The solution of a practical problem is usually not difficult. What's difficult is to analyze the detailed assumptions and conditions for, the, for your algorithm to work. That's the most difficult part. The design itself, may or may not be difficult in practice. What is difficult is uh, how you can prove that it works uh, as a general algorithm, okay? So general procedure of control design, uh, if we recall what we have done up, up till now, is this, this is a usually uh, common procedure. First of all, you have to define what, your, what problem you're solving and then you design, you design your controllers for the solution. So currently, we are using pole placement. And I mentioned very soon we will do the, it's called prototype. Prototype repetitive control. This is the second approach. Approach one, approach two. Okay. Then uh, you have to show that your algorithm works. You have to prove the stability and you have to prove the, uh, so from time to time you have to prove that your design is robust. You have stability robustness. Then finally, you do some case study or implementation results, okay? So I hope from this example of pole placement design, you have a general idea of these procedures for control design, okay? And then we'll implement these We'll do these kind of steps again in the case of prototype repetitive control. Second uh, algorithm we're gonna discuss today. Okay, let's talk about the simple case. We're assuming the disturbance structure is this, repetitive disturbance. And then if, as a simple example, if all the poles and all the zeros of the plant are stable, Okay, then prototype repetitive control is about one design approach for this controller C over here. And it's simple enough that it found many applications and convinced many uh, industrial engineers to use this idea, okay? The controller looks like this. It's amazingly simple. So you have the plant denom numeral denominator is gonna show up in your controller, okay? It looks like this. BP, the plant numerator appears as a denominator of the controller. The plant denominator appears as a numerator of the controller, okay? And then the remaining steps, remaining components are, first of all, the structure of the disturbance, and then second, some, uh, some additional terms, which is, uh, looks very simple. And then the result of this guy, of doing, of choosing to design controller this way is this. Under these assumptions above, under the assumptions that poles and zeros of the plant are stable, this closed loop system has guaranteed stability for a range of gains in the controller. Okay, that's the result. Looks simple and easy, it's easy to Looks, looks like not very difficult to implement at all, okay? So the design is simple. What is needed is to show that it works and convince the audience that this is a beneficial design approach. So let me, uh, let's go over this proof of the theorem of prototype repetitive control. 
oh, by the way, it's called, it's called prototype repetitive control uh, because this was introduced in 19, either at the end of 1980, uh, 1970s or at the beginning of 1980s, okay? It's called repet prototype repetitive control because after its introduction, many, en many researchers started looking into this and developed extensions of this idea. Okay, so let's see. Let's prove that the design will have guaranteed stability under these stated conditions. We have uh, the closed loop characteristic polynomial is coming from one plus PC in this case equal to zero. So I have P here and I have the controller here. If you do the computation, you're gonna get the closed loop characteristic equation is gonna be uh, multiply out, multiply these terms out. You're gonna have BP AP times one minus Z negative N plus KR Z negative N plus D then uh, Z negative D. Okay, these are the common polynomials I can factor out. So inside I'm gonna get this guy plus this guy times this guy. So it's equals to one minus Z negative N plus KR Z negative N, which is gonna be one minus uh, KR minus one, Z to the power of negative N. Okay, so we have assumed recall our assumption that the plant has stable poles and stable zero. So all the roots of these guys are stable. So they won't cause instability. What's remaining to be done is to show that the poles out of this part is gonna be stable as well, okay? Let's take a look at this case. What are the roots of this polynomial equation? Okay, there are Two, two, con two uh, conditions to consider. First of all is uh, if one minus KR is positive, then what you need to have is that uh, one minus some positive term, some positive gain, Z negative N has to equal to zero. Okay, so the solution, this is a, this is a Earns order polynomial equation. How many roots does this equation have? N, right? Okay, so the solutions is gonna be, let me, let me denote this guy as, uh, let me factor out, let me say this is alpha. Let me consider this as a gain is alpha. Then this is alpha one, divided by n, z, I'm not negative, so I'm ab absorbing this alpha inside this here. Then this polynomial equation, you can see, the solution is gonna be <coughs> this guy, this compact number has to uh, be one. This guy has to be one for this to hold. And the solution is this. It's difficult to draw, let me just write it. Okay, the solution is that alpha negative one divided by n, z, has to equal to, uh, let me be careful, exponential of j two pi I divided by n. Let me see if it works. Looks like, okay, if this happens, if this happens, I'm gonna have the nth power, nth order of this is gonna be e j two pi i, okay? This i is uh, uh, zero, one, two, et cetera, et cetera. J is the, uh, uh, j is square root of negative one here, okay? So this guy you see, is a exponential function that repeatedly, if i is equal to zero, this, this guy is here. If i equals to one, is this vector rotated by two pi, so it's again here, so it's one. And then 
uh, after many more rotations, it's going to always come back to here. So if this happens, you see, uh, we have this condition that uh, the result is going to be 1. Okay? So uh, summarizing, I have here. I have here. This is the result. Okay? So uh, my alpha here is going to be 1 minus kr. So in the end, I'm going to have 1 minus kr to the power of max, yeah, yeah, here. The result is going to be 1 minus kr to the power of negative 1 divided by n e well, times z equal to this exponential function here, so e something here. Then you put this on the right-hand side, you're going to get this. This is the solution. This is the pole for this polynomial equation. Okay? Then do the same thing for the case Do the same thing for the case 1 minus kr is uh, negative. Okay? So what's going to change is that you have 1 minus some, now this is negative times z negative n. Okay? So this is uh, not very convenient to do, so this is negative. What's more convenient to do is to 1 change it to 1, let's see. There are two ways to do, I think. Change it to this guy, z negative n. In this case, kr minus 1 is going to be, kr minus 1 is going to be negative, okay? Let's see. I'm confused. kr minus 1 is going to be positive. Yeah, I think this is correct. So one minus ki is negative. So I have the scaling term ahead of here is going to be negative. So yeah, yeah, now I find it. So I do this uh, translation of this equation. I make this to be positive. So what are the if uh, what are the solution for this part? You're going to see this. This guy has to be equal to negative 1, which is e to the power of j times pi times uh, identity plus 2 pi. Okay? Huh? Pi plus, yeah, yeah, uh, pi plus 2 pi i. That's the, that's the case. Okay. I think I have a typo here. I will correct this. So uh, you see here, this guy has to equal to this guy. So kr minus 1 z negative n has to equal to e j pi plus 2 pi i. And then you're going to have z has to equal to, the pole has to equal to, put this on the right-hand side, uh, z to the power of n has to equal to kr minus 1 times e negative j pi plus 2 pi i. Oh, maybe I don't have a typo. So in result, z has to equal to kr minus 1 uh, to the power of 1 divided by n. And here, negative j pi plus 2 pi i divided by n. Okay, so these are the poles. There are n of them in this case. Okay, I think if I do a little bit translation, I can get from here to here. Okay. But that's the basic picture. So the, the picture is that the final conclusion is that no matter what are the conditions for KR, I'm going to have this guy in the, as the root. So it's going to be this, uh, this term multiplies some term that has unit uh, magnitude, okay? So if one minus, if kr 
is in the range of the, where is it? The kr is in the range of zero and two. You see, one minus kr, the magnitude of one minus kr is going to be always less than one. Okay, so the magnitude of these roots are always less than one. So uh, we are show we have then shown that the poles of the closed loop system from here here are stable, and the poles from here are also stable under this uh, design of KR. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So uh, we have now review. We have now finished the design of the controller. We have now showed the ability of the system. Now, can someone look at the result here and tell me one thing that we haven't done yet? This is the controller transfer function. This is the plant transfer function. So you see, the controller requires the plant model. Now we have mentioned this plant uncertainty in practice always exists. Okay. If you do this design, if you think the plant models are like this, but in practice they are not. So you don't you don't you now won't have this perfect result over here. So you have to consider the stability robustness. Stability robustness in this case. So this is how it looks like as a big picture. So when the plant is no longer what you think it is, it has uncertainties inside. Let me do the example. I'm assuming the uncertainty looks like this. This uncertainty is characterizing the uh, actu actuator, actuator dynamics in practice. If n is four in this case, then uh, you see everything here are fixed. The only thing that's changing is kr. So I can do a root locus analysis by changing by analyzing this closed loop pose. This kr is uh, changing. So the result is going to be this. The closed loop pose is going to be the. These are just a part of it. It's going to be going from the open loop poles to the open loop zero. Okay, so you see now, open loop pole has four poles at this location. One, two, three, four, coming out of here, and then another open loop pole comes out of the pole of this guy, which is T, so it's this guy. So if you do the uh, root locus analysis, then you see, this is going to happen because the zeros of this open loop transfer function. What? Yeah, let me ask you. What are the zeros of this open loop transfer function? This can also be a tricky question. So definitely, the open loop zeros is going to contain the roots of these guys. Okay, I haven't plotted here. And then, this is a hidden message. The remaining open loop poles are at infinity. The remaining open loop poles are at infinity. Okay, think about it. And if you have trouble, you can see me. Okay, so the root locus is going to look like this. You see, immediately once kr becomes positive, then the closed loop pose becomes immediately unstable. If we have this plant uncertainty in the system, 
Okay? So that means this design is not robust. Doesn't have robust stability uh, built inside the design. Okay? So to solve this problem, the designer of the repetitive prototype repetitive control came up with this idea. So instead of using a pure structure of the disturbance, we said we mentioned the pure structure of the disturbance looks like this. Do a little bit modification. Multiply this guy here, Q, Z, Z inverse, which is a low pass filter. Multiply this inside, both in the numerator and in the denominator over here. Then you can show that this design becomes robust in a, uh, has robust stability built inside. Okay, uh, let me see how I will do that. Mm, next time I will talk about, uh, yeah, as an exercise, go back and check why this, uh, why the close to poles out of here becomes stable. And then next time we're gonna discuss the details together. All right, so see you next week.